when it comes to the fight against insurance companies, large corporations, and the healthcare industry, injured victims are always the underdog. But that doesn't worry us. At Messon Associates, we're an injury law firm from Philadelphia, and we come to fight. Our clients know that they've got representation with a chip on its shoulder, and it's the same chip that makes Philly the toughest city in the country. Call 215-568-3500 or visit us online at messalaw.com. Messa & Associates, the toughest injury firm in Philadelphia. G-L-E-S Eagles Eagles fans, welcome to another edition of Football 24-7. I'm your guy, Tony DeShields II, and I'm joined by our Eagles insider, John McMullen. Before we get into the content, you guys know what you have to do. Smash that like button. Make sure you guys are always engaged in the content. Make sure you guys are subscribed to the Jacob Sports YouTube channel. Now, let's not waste any time here, John. This is a big week for the Philadelphia Eagles, first and foremost. You set it off air. You've been busy all week, ripping and running, trying to cover this team. So many so many, so many different changes, injuries, the Julio Jones news. Uh, again, big matchup with the Miami Dolphins. Eagles coming off of an ugly loss to the New York Jets. First and foremost, man, how are you feeling today? And then secondly, what's been the pulse around the Novacare complex? Uh, uh, it's been, it's been a, a, a good week, I would say for the Eagles. I think, you know, maybe a little bit of a wake up call, uh, game against the Jets. Um, and, and it could be a silver lining to, to losing a game like that. Cause you get refocused, you know, started feeling themselves winning week in and week out. And all of a sudden you think you're in control late in the game and, um, Sometimes, you know, NFL games, bad decision, bang, all of a sudden you lose a football game. So, yeah, I, I thought the Eagles took the Jets for granted a little bit. And and, and as I said, perhaps a little bit of a silver lining in advance of a, a much more talented team. Obviously, the number one offense in the NFL, uh, the most explosive offense in the NFL. Um 500 yards a game, 37 points a game. So, um, you know, you got to come with your A game this week to to deal with that. So um, maybe, and we'll see, maybe it was a, a good thing for the Eagles to get, you know, knocked down a peg. You said something interesting, the fact that they potentially took the New York Jets for granted. And we're going to obviously get into the Miami Dolphins. That's the talk of the town here. But I want to address that. That doesn't seem quite like this Philadelphia Eagles team to take or to overlook an opponent, rather. But I'm curious to know why do you potentially think that was and what indicators uh, led you to that notion? Um, I, I, I think it was about the quarterback, let's be honest. And, and Zach Wilson has not played well, uh, not playing well. And I think, you know, it's human nature. I, I think the Eagles do a good job in general to avoid trap games, whatever you want to call them. Um, doesn't mean they're perfect. Um, doesn't mean you don't sort of, you have to actively avoid, you know, the human nature aspect of, of, of a letdown at that point. So, and, and I think, as I said, the Eagles are generally better at that than most organizations, but I think you saw little signs and, you know, uh, 
whether it was injury related, just being extra cautious. I think there was a, a couple guys that they said, you know what, we can probably give them an extra week. Um, things like that. You know, I was concerned about um, Lane Johnson, obviously coming out of the Jets game and it's clear he was a full practice today. It's clear he's ready to go. You know, were they being cautious? Maybe maybe saying we can get through this game without him. Um, things like that, just little things. And, and yeah, you know, they they wouldn't be the first, they'd never admit that kind of stuff, but of course, um, you know, everybody's all of a sudden ready to go except for Reed Blankenship and Bradley Roby. So there were all these injuries, perceived injuries, and all of a sudden they're ready to go for Miami. So, just a little bit of a hunch, shall shall we say? Uh, that okay, they, they were being cautious, and they were being cautious because they thought they could be cautious. Ah, uh, I mean, I get it. You know, the New York Jets, but you know, outside of Aaron Rodgers being out, when you look at that roster from top to bottom, a lot of people felt like that was a pretty legit roster. Um, let's you know, let's go over to the injury side, right? You mentioned Lane Johnson. Um, the word is he's going to be playing uh, this weekend. Uh, the final injury report, I think, will come out maybe tomorrow, right? Um, no, it's out. It came okay, out. it's out. Okay, yeah. okay. So yeah. can you give us um, the 411 on um, the Philadelphia Eagles and their injuries, who's playing, who's not playing, who practiced, who was limited, uh, who's out, you know, so on and so forth? Uh, Reed uh, Blankenship and, and Bradley Roby are out. They've been uh, declared out, and obviously that's a problem because uh, secondary is probably the biggest issue. Uh, nobody else has an injury de a designation, so everybody else is in. Now, hmm. Jalen Carter, Dallas Goddard, Devontae Smith were still limited today in practice, but they have no game designation, so that means they're a full go. Sidney Brown has missed three games, full go. We mentioned Lane Johnson. Eli Ricks is another guy who left the game. He's a full go. Darius Slay, they held out. He's a full go. Marlon Tui, Pelotu, Milton Williams, everybody, full go. Um, so it's kind of what I was saying. Um, it seems like in hindsight, they were being a little bit cautious. And, you know, I use Sidney Brown as an example because Sidney told me Thursday, Thursday in advance of the the Jets game that he was good to go. He was fine. Uh, and they held him out another week. Um, so take that for what you will. Now, sometimes players, players always want to play. So some, sometimes you got to protect them from themselves. And Nick mentioned that today, but he's a full practice all week. It wasn't even limited. So, you know, did he magically get better from, Sunday to Wednesday, maybe. I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> gamesmanship, John. You know the Philadelphia Eagles. <laughs> well, that's not gamesmanship. They were just being cautious with the guy because they thought, you know, it's it's the New York Jets. And you're right. That's the whole point. It was about the quarterback. Look, that's a Super Bowl contender with Aaron Rodgers. Mm -hmm. um, the defense is very good. Um, and then all of a sudden you start saying, well, oh, and Reed Blankenship gets hurt and you don't have Sidney Brown. And Lane Johnson gets hurt and you got to finish the game with Jack Driscoll. So things can change dramatically on a dime in this league. Um, Jody and I talk about player management, load management, whatever you want to call it. That's why you can't do that in the NFL because – the injury rate is so high you can't afford if somebody's if somebody's ready to go play them the good thing about this week is Sidney Brown is ready to go now he is a rookie and the Philadelphia Eagles defense they're going to be facing off against maybe their most explosive matchup of the season uh, in this Miami Dolphins team um They've been compared to the greatest show on turf, right? But uh, as far as I'm concerned, they might be the greatest show on surf. I stole that from someone. Can't, can't remember who it was, but I heard it somewhere. Um, <laughs> so 
I think about this Miami Dolphins team and how electric and how explosive they are and how and they had the ability to take the top off any defense. And then you're missing Reed Blankenship, right? Uh, you know, your best safety. You're missing Justin Evans, arguably maybe your best coverage safety. And you're left with Sidney Brown and Terrell Edmonds. Terrell Edmonds is not really known for his coverage. Sidney Brown, uh, uh, what you know, a web behind the years, uh, safety who's still trying to figure it out coming off of an injury, and he was done with a hamstring. And you know, you go going up against those guys in Miami, you're gonna have to use those legs, you're gonna have to uh, use your speed to keep up with those guys. So, um, having a tight hamstring isn't ne necessarily optimal for a guy like Sidney Brown. But you know, these DBs obviously, Slay has been dealing with a nagging knee injury. Um, he didn't play last week, uh, he's gonna play this week. But you think you, you, you think about all that information that I laid out there, and then you think about what the Dolphins can just do on a dime. I mean, I, it, is this Eagles defense in trouble, John? Uh, I, I, you know, the Eagles defense, whether they're playing the Dolphins or, or Zach Wilson is, is built on the same thing. Um, pressure up front. So are they going to get pressure? And by pressure, I don't mean sacks. I mean, speed up the quarterback because, uh, Tua gets the ball out very quickly by design because Miami has, uh, on paper, weak offensive line. Um, so they know they have to speed things up in general. Um, so I'm not talking about sacks, but I'm talking about right. um, just uh, make, as you saw last week, um, I constantly argue with Jody about this as well. And he saw it last week. Well, Jermaine Johnson didn't get a sack. But he got his hands on 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 Jalen Hurts, and it turned into an interception, which is even better. So that can happen. Um, happened in the NFC Championship game back when they won the Super Bowl with Chris Long. Didn't get a sack. Affected the quarterback. Patrick Robinson takes it back for a pick six, and essentially the game was over from there. Um, pressure, pressure is more important than sacks. Sacks are never bad, but when you have certain teams, and this is one of them, who are going by design to get the ball out of their hands quickly, trying to get it in space to Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell, um, just hurry them up. Get them off the spots. Um, you know, And Jalen Carter being back is a big part of that um, because nothing um, – makes a, a quarterback more uncomfortable than pressure right up the middle. Um, and look, the Eagles defense is built on that front. Good weeks, bad weeks, indifferent weeks. That's who's got to carry them. And the same is true this week as last week, as next week. They have to make up for the deficiencies in the middle of the field. And that's every week. When I think about the Eagles in the trenches, offensively and defensively, right, I would take their groups over the Miami Dolphins any day of the week, right? And the goal is to speed up Tua's clock. But when you think about the fact that Tua is one of the, one of the best in terms of getting the ball out quick, I mean, you mentioned it, you know, their defense is designed for him to get it out quick, especially because their offensive line isn't necessarily considered one of the best, you know, Thinking about that, it, it it makes me wonder how fat, like how much can this defensive line truly impact the game if their offense is already designed to get the ball out quickly? Oh, they can impact it tremendously. I I mean, one of the reasons, um, perfect to be perfectly honest, is also health wise. I mean, there was a concern that uh, Tua wouldn't even be cleared to play this year because of all the concussions he suffered um, last year. Um, so that's part of their offensive plan as well. They're trying to protect the quarterback. Um, you know, it might be a, 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 a just a simple pass where he's, you know, completed a spot or something. Okay. And, and, and hit uh, significantly. Um there could be a million ways to impact a quarterback in an NFL game with the with the defensive front. And I know I was talking to some Eagles people today, and that's what they're focused on because they think they have a huge advantage, and they're right. 
uh, their defensive front versus Miami's offensive line. That's where this game is going to be won if the Eagles do win the game. That's where it's going to be won. Um, no question about it to me. So I want to throw something at you and see what your thoughts are about it. Obviously, we know the Philadelphia Eagles on offense. They're the best team in terms of third down conversion. And uh, they are, I believe, right now, well, if you want to say prior to Thursday night, they would have been ranked fifth in terms of third down attempts with uh, 87. Um, but after New Orleans and Jacksonville played, they're ranked sixth. So they're pretty much um, in the top five, top six in terms of third down attempts. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're putting a lot of third down situations on offense. When it comes to the Miami Dolphins, on the other hand, their offense is rarely put in many third down situations. As a matter of fact, even though they're converting their third downs at a 44% clip, which I believe is ranked seventh in the NFL, um, they're ranked 31st in the NFL in terms of third down attempts with 59. Only the Seattle Seahawks are lower than them, and that's 57. So when I when I look at that number, 59 third down attempts, and how electric this offense is and how quickly they're able to score and move the ball, they're not really forced or put into too many third down situations or even third along for that matter. You know, knowing that, what can the Philadelphia Eagles do to try to create those third down situations for the Miami Dolphins? Again, it's not like they're middle of the pack or, you know, they, they're literally one of – they hardly see third down. If the Eagles force them in third down situations, um, does that bowl well um, more so for the Eagles? Or is this Dolphins offense still just too electric to just think you can – as long as you put them in third down, you're going to win the game? Um. What what do I tell you every week? Everything's contextual, Tim. I, of course, I mean, they of course. Played, they played the Chargers. They played the Patriots. They played the Broncos. They played the Giants. They played the Panthers. That's not their fault. Um, that's who was on their schedule. Um, and that, to me, says they're a good team because they've beaten teams they should beat. Um, right. And that tells me they're a good team. Now, they played one game – where they weren't supposed to win and they didn't win and they lost by four touchdowns at Buffalo. I, I think people look in the black and white of, of, of the Miami Dolphins offense through six games and you see the numbers and you see number one in total offense, number one in rushing offense, number one in passing offense, number one in points per game, number one mm -hmm. in third down offense, number one in red zone offense. They weren't number one in all those categories at Buffalo. You know, this is a you harder a place. Point. This is a harder place to play than Buffalo. Right. Um, when, when the fan base gets going. So to me, and I said this when I, when I predicted the Eagles to win, um, to me, this is a bigger game than Miami. They're the ones with something to prove. That's what if I'm hearing. Think about I'm hearing a lot of that. I'm hearing a lot of people say the exact same thing. You know, this is a bigger game for Miami because they're the ones who are trying to prove that they're for real, whereas though the Eagles, they're coming off of a season where, you know, they're trying to just maintain. Yeah. Right. And, and, and whatever, San Francisco, um, Baltimore, uh, Kansas City, obviously. Uh, all of these teams have been, Buffalo, have been battle-tested. Even a team mm. like Buffalo, yeah, have they lost in the AFC Championship game? Have they blown? Sure. But they were in it and 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 should have won it. And they've been battled through that. This Miami team hasn't done anything other than pile up a bunch of style points against a bad foot against a bunch of bad football teams. And they deserve credit for that because look, San Francisco lost to Cleveland with PJ Walker. The Eagles lost to the Jets with with uh Zach Wilson in the same weekend. It's a tough league to win in every single week. So they deserve credit for taking better care of business against Denver and scoring 40 points and getting 42 against Carolina last week and boat racing the Giants. That's all you can do. That's the pin that's up there. Knock it yeah. down. So you, they can make, you can make an argument. The Eagles, you can make an argument. Sorry to cut you off, John, but you can also make an argument. Eagles and Niners, they lost to two of arguably maybe the most talented front sevens in football. Yeah, well, you know, and 
and that's why I don't get caught up in in sort of especially in and and the sample size is getting larger. We've talked about small sample size on the show. It's getting larger. It's getting more impactful as it goes on week after week. But still, unless you unless you boil it down to all right, they scored seventy points against the Denver Broncos. Now uh, Devin A. Shane, who isn't playing because he's hurt, right. is averaging twelve yards a carry. So let's just pretend he wasn't hurt. You really think he's going to average twelve yards per carry at Lincoln Absolutely Financial not. Field? No. Absolutely not. So what does it mean? What is what, what does it really mean? Raheem Mostert averages six yards a carry, and and eleven touchdowns. He's got eleven touchdowns. Are you really worried that much about Raheem Mostert? I, I you know he's been around for a while. The Eagles signed him as an undrafted free agent in twenty fifteen. He's never had a thousand yards rushing. It's very fast, um, but he can stay healthy for the most part. He's a track guy, but uh, yeah, I mean, now Tyree Kill, yeah, now that's somebody you should be worried about. Jalen Waddle, that's somebody you should be worried about. Okay, um, there's there's significant talent on that team, but I don't care that they scored seventy points against the Denver Broncos. Who cares? Well done. <laughs> I'll tip my cap to them. <laughs> you know, the best thing I can say about the Miami Dolphins is, and I was, I, we were talking to Greg Cote from the Miami Her- Herald. This is where right. Miami's different. They got down 14 nothing against Carolina. Hasn't won a game. The only winless team in the NFL. And nobody panicked because they knew they were going to come back. So they have gotten mm. better. They're, they're, they're talented. Mike's doing a good job with the offense, but I don't care about the style points against bad teams. So, you know, you mentioned the guys we need to worry about, right? Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle, those guys. Um, Tyreek Hill, man, he's having a, a stellar campaign right now. You know, there's, you know, there's, there's nothing more you could really say about it. I'll admit, John, even though, and I'll give my actual score later on, but I do have the Eagles notching this game. I have the Eagles winning this game, but it's not without my own level of concerns, right? Tyreek Hill, you know, I remember when the Philadelphia Eagles uh, matched up with those guys in, in the uh, joint practices, and he got, he, you know, he kind of put Darius Lane, to, you know, in the blender uh, a couple times. Uh, I'm curious to know, you know, what's your thoughts on the matchups, um, you know, with the Eagles uh, corners versus uh you know, those, um, you know, Miami, uh, you know, track guys and Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle. You know, just give me, you know, just give me your breakdown of how you how you anticipate those matchups going. Uh, the Eagles are going to play a ton of zone. They're going to play, um, you know, they're going to play in the parking lots at Lincoln Financial Field. And they're going to force um, Tua to go down the field, 14, 15 play drives, make sure um, – they keep Tyreek in front of them. Um, and that's built in the philosophy to begin with, uh, with, with the Fangio defense. Um, but even more so this week, uh, and even more so without Reed Blankenship and Bradley Roby. So now you got to go, who knows? You might have to go with Sidney Brown. I don't know who they're going to start at safety. It might be Makai Gardner. It might be Tristan McCollum. They did bring um, back Josiah Scott. Could be him. Joe could be Josiah Scott, but Josiah's got to start in the slot, I think. Mm. Um, so, you know, they got a bunch of issues in the secondary, and that means more zone uh, than than even usual. Um, keep everything in front of you, um, and hope uh, your defensive line gets home. Which I, I, you know. Hope is not a strategy. Say that all the time. How he says that, but I mean, look. When you talk, what does everybody talk about? I say the same thing with the Atlanta Falcons. Everybody gets him. I get why Tyree Kill, Jalen Waddle, Tua, um, Devin A. Shane, Raheem Mostert, who runs twenty three miles an hour in pads. Um, you know who nobody talks about. You know, Connor Williams, Robert Hunt, Kendall Lamb, Austin Jackson. You know why they don't talk about them? Because they stink and they can't block anybody. And what do I always say? 
if you can't block people, you can't play offense. Mm. Now, can they block the New York Giants? Can they block the – yes. Can they block the Denver Broncos? Yes. Can they block Hassan Reddick and Josh Sweat and Jalen Carter and Fletcher Cox? I'll believe it when I see it. Hey, man, you make it sound you, – I'll admit, John, you make that sound real good. I'll be honest with you, man. Um, You're right, though. I mean, at the end of the day, this Philadelphia Eagles, you know, they're – you know, their edge rushers, uh, you know, their D tackles, they are some of the most talented, uh, you know, in the NFL. They're arguably the deepest defensive line in the NFL. And that's nothing to sneeze at, right? I mean, you know, it's it's something you genuinely have to take serious. And when you think about Tua's injury history, right, and how volatile this Eagles defensive line can be, you know, we've seen Jalen Carter, Jalen Carter have violent sacks and how it influenced or how it impacted the trajectory of a game. We've seen Hassan Reddick knock quarterbacks out of a game you know this philadelphia philadelphia eagles defensive line the reality is they're no joke and two of those guys they're going to have to be they're going to have to be mindful and two is going to have to keep his head on swivel um you know for me i'm looking at okay this this Dolphins team is talented we get that this eagles defensive line they're talented we get that but can the dbs hold up long enough so those guys can actually get to their spots and not two on the ground. That's what I think about. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not worried about giving them 11 kisses as Robert. So, <laughs> you know, I, I don't wish injury on anybody. Um, of course not. Yeah. That's, and that's not what we're talking about, right? Yeah, we're just talking about I, trying to I, make sure I, he's I'm, on. I'm just worried about making him throw the football before he wants to throw the football. Mm. And he's susceptible to turning it over if that's the case. Um, he, he, you know, so, and I think that's going to be the case. I mean, th the Dolphins have one really good offensive lineman, and that's Teron Armstead, and he's on injured reserve. So, you know, I talk about the foundation and building the right way all the time, and that's where I think the Eagles sort of separate themselves compared to a lot of the league. And it's you got to be very disciplined because all people talk about is the skill position players. Even here in Philadelphia, everybody's excited about Julio Jones. You should be more excited than Lane Johnson looks 100%. Yeah, yeah, I, um, yeah I, I, that's what I'm more so concerned about. Uh, and 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 he looks great. Obviously, he's not 100%, but he looks fine and ready to go. Um, you would think people would learn from watching the Eagles week in and week out. You saw another example of it um, last week when Lane went out of the game. Not the same. Not the same. You you do not look good. The Eagles have plenty of playmakers. They did not look good because they couldn't block a talented defensive front. It's it's it, it's not a secret. If you can't block people, you can't play offense in this league. I say it all the time. You can have the greatest players in the world, um, and Tyreek Hill is certainly among them, just like A.J. Brown is. And A.J. had a big game against the Jets, but in key moments, the Eagles couldn't move the football, and they ended up scoring 14 points with A.J. Brown and Dallas Goddard and Devontae Smith and DeAndre Swift. They couldn't block the Jets, and that's what happens. You know, Sean Desai, he had a pretty good uh, outing against the Los Angeles Rams. Uh, he managed to somehow uh, limit uh, Puka Nakua. He managed to somehow limit uh, Cooper Cup in the second half, right? More so in the second half. He managed to turn that defense around in the second half. And, you know, we, we talked about those guys, Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle. You know, I'm curious, what can – a game like this do for Sean Desai's confidence as a defensive coordinator, if he can find a way to limit guys like Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle, knowing the numbers uh, that they're capable of putting up. You know, if if the Eagles do happen to keep Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle at bay, are you, you know, by, by your estimation, would that be, uh, you know, the personnel, uh, more so better personnel, or, or rather Sean Desai found a way to, um, put his guys in the best position to possibly succeed. Uh, I, I, I hate to boil it down, but as I just did, it's, it's about 
It's about the know, players. It's about <laughs> the players. It's about the defensive front with the Eagles. Right. Um, you know, if they don't, if if the defensive front has a bad game, and that's possible, everybody has a bad game. Tom Brady has had bad games. Um, you're in trouble. You're right. you're 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 in deep 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 trouble. Um, you know, Jim Swartz is what what's old is new again. Jim Swartz is the toast of the NFL uh, with the number one uh, defense, and he's got those guys just balling out in Cleveland and Miles Garrett's going to be the defensive player of the year. If he keeps it up, uh, he's playing an unbelievable level. You know, Jim gave up 613 yards in the Super Bowl that he won. That, right. That, um, I still think about that sometimes like, damn, like, yeah. how did they win that game? Um, Games and Jim is the one who said it. That's why I bring him up. Games have personalities, um, mm-hmm. and it's you quote real. Jim a lot. You quote Jim yeah. a lot. Games well, have personalities, startup costs. You know, it, well, it's fun. I, yeah, I I like Jim. Jim's a great coach. Um, great football mind. Great defensive mind. But your point about like, you know, he's just as competent after giving up six hundred thirteen yards as giving up. 150 um, because he knows he's doing the right things from a, from a schematic standpoint. But if you don't have the horses, you don't have the horses or if Tom Brady gets hot, Tom Brady gets hot. Um, And, you know, in that case, the Eagles got home once and, you know, the rest is history with BG and Derek Barnett. Um, yeah, so I I don't think if Sean Desai has a bad game, it's going to affect his competence. Um, I think if the Eagles have a bad game, it's because the defensive front didn't have a good game, mm. and then they're in trouble. I mean, they they'd be in trouble if they had Reed and and Justin Evans and Bradley Roby, or even if you can want to go back to Avante Maddox, right. um, and nobody was hurt they'd be in trouble if the defensive front didn't affect the game. They'd be in trouble against this team. I mean, that's a good point, though. The reality is the way the, the way the Philadelphia Eagles are built, even on both sides of the ball, um, if the Eagles offensive line has a bad game, it's finito. If the Eagles uh, defensive line doesn't have a good game, same thing. But that's just how they're built, right? And you got to respect that because um, if you have a good offensive line and a good defensive line, nine times out of ten, you're going to be in a hunt for – you're going to be in the hunt each and every season. Um, a couple more questions for you, John, before we get out of here. Um, I want to make sure you still have some of your Friday left. Um, Eagles, Harry Roseman, trade that line. Um, we know that the Eagles are dealing with, you know, injuries in various spots. We've already seen them make a move to bring in uh, Julio Jones, a free agency. Um, they decided to bring in um, Josiah Scott, I believe. I believe, uh, yeah, Ben Brand, Josiah Scott. He was on the Steelers, but then he was on IR. I think he was cut, if I'm not mistaken. So he, they, they decided to bring those guys in for depth purposes. The trade deadline is approaching uh, about, in about a week and some change. Do you anticipate any moves from Harry Roseman? And if so, uh, at what positions do you believe they're likely to bring in some additional talent? Uh, well, secondary first and foremost. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if something is available, you know, none of the moves that they've made, and that includes Roby and, um, even before, uh, Josiah Scott, um, who by the way, was signed off the practice squad. That's why they had to, so he's guaranteed three games, Got it. um, on, on the Eagles roster. Um, and that's all he's guaranteed. Um, if they can get an upgrade, they'll try and get an upgrade, but that's easier said than done. So we'd start there. Now receiver would have been another, but they brought in Julio Jones. How much does he have left? I, I don't know. I, you know, I, he's one of the all time greats, but he's obviously not at that level anymore. Um, and you know, is he going to be helpful? He hasn't been obviously on a team, wasn't in camp. Uh, has had some injury issues over the past three years. 
a lot of hamstring issues. Can you just throw them out there and expect them to to go at a high level? A lot of question marks on as they try to get better. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously the secondary and and I think the linebackers have been better than the Eagles expected. Um, Nick Morrow's been solid. Zach Cunningham's been fine. Now you have Nicobe Dean back, so that looked like a big knee, but doesn't look like as big of a need. I, I think it, at this point, it's all secondary, all secondary. If you can get something great, if you can't, you got to cobble it together. But even if they get, you know, probably the best player that people constantly talk about is Buda Baker. Um, even if they get a player like that, it doesn't, you, know, you get a much better player, but it doesn't change the way the defense has to play. And by that, I mean defensive front. They got to get home week in and week out. Agreed. A uh, final question for you, John, and it's more so like a two parter. Um, with Julio Jones coming in here, uh, you add him in with A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith. You still have Olamide Zacchaeus. Uh, you have Dallas Goddard, DeAndre Swift back there, but more so the receiving guys, you know, like I mentioned. Um, what do you anticipate uh, the Philadelphia Eagles doing with Julio Jones um, as they begin to ramp him up um, from a route concept perspective? You know, you know, will we see him in a slot? Will we see him on the boundary at times? Are they going to move these guys around and get, try to get creative with it? What do you anticipate the Philadelphia Eagles do with Julio Jones as they ramp him up? And the second part of the question, you know, with uh, this new look repertoire for Jalen Hurts, um, is this a bounce back week for Jalen Hurts? You know, how, what do you anticipate for Jalen Hurts in this game? This is a big game. He's facing off with Tua. Some are calling this the Nick Saban Bowl. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, what's your, you know, what, what are your overall thoughts on just Julio Jones being a part of this offense and then, um, Jalen Hurts facing off with Tua Tagovailoa, um, you know, in the battle for Nick Saban's um, uh, favor. Uh, favor. <laughs> well, Nick doesn't care. <laughs> of course one. he doesn't, right? Of course he uh, doesn't. Yeah, a lot of people have made that. They, those guys are friends. They've been friends. We know, we they know, but never, it's exciting, John. It's exciting. Yeah, they were it's never, exciting. they were, but yeah, but I just mean that there's a lot of people that try to, like Jalen's upset because he lost his job to Tua. Tua had nothing to do with it. If he's upset at anybody, it would be Nick Saban. But these but, guys are competitors, yeah. right? And as a competitor, I would imagine in your core, you're like, oh, that guy. Well, guy. they're competitors. Yeah, they want to beat each other. They want to. Right. They want their teams to win. But how does that change from every week? I mean, Jalen's pissed I off. Guess, the, uh, uh, as far as what happened years ago versus days ago. Jalen's going to be more pissed off about what happened and making a mistake against the Jets late Good in the point. game. He, he, you know, they'll be trading jerseys after the game. They're, they're friends. Um, and they have been. And if you go all the way back to the championship game where Jalen was benched and Tua brought um, Alabama back to win the national championship, um, you know, Right after on on social media, Tua was like pissed off at people that were Alabama fans that were criticizing Jalen Hurts, and he was defending him. And then the next year, people forget uh, Jalen had to come in in the SEC championship game and win that game to get Alabama back to the national championship. So those guys liked each other; they've always liked each other. Um, but yeah, there it's like if you're playing. Uh, uh, your best friend or your brother on the basketball court. And want to, do you want to beat him? Of course, I want to kick his ass, him. Don. I want to kick yeah, his ass. <laughs> everybody, of course. <laughs> but that doesn't mean there's bitterness or I don't know. It's weird to me that people uh, go down that route. That's all I'm saying. I, I get that for you. So Jalen, um, yeah, he's more focused on what happened at the end of that Jets game. Um, and as far as Julio, yeah, I, I don't know how they're going to use him. That It makes no mm. sense to me. Mm. Um, now that Devontae Smith, you know, I said, well, all of a sudden Devontae popped up on the injury report with a hamstring. And I'm saying, well, maybe that's why Julio's here. Maybe they're concerned. But no, Devontae's going to play. I, 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 they, they can't get the ball to the playmakers they have. What, what, I, I don't expect a big, impact from julio jones unless somebody gets hurt 
Um, as far as where he plays, I would imagine they've moved Devonte more into the slot, uh, especially on key high leverage third down situations. Um, that would be my guess, but we have to wait to see how it shakes out. Julio Jones isn't a slot receiver. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get, I don't get it. Um, and I've said that before, but you know, people don't value role players, role players. There's a, there's a key to it and generally stars and don't get me wrong. Julio Jones is going to the hall of fame. He was a great, there's about a five year span where you could make a strong argument. He was the best receiver in the NFL. Um, great receiver in his prime. You don't see guys like that turned into Zach Pascal. I've heard a lot of, well, he can use Zach Pascal's role. And yeah. now, now we can. You heard what he said, right? You were there. I'm, yeah. I came here to, I came here to dominate. Yeah, so, exactly. And, uh, and you also heard what he, he doesn't said have a Zach Pascal mentality. Yeah, and, and that's, that's the part that gets overlooked, right? That's why I didn't think it was a personnel issue on that side of the ball because, again, you know, everyone has a role. And uh, Olamide Zacchaeus, you know, I look at him, I'm like, okay, he understands what he is, right? You know, he understands that he's a he, he's a guy that's out there maybe to block, maybe to catch some short, quick, you know, garbage routes or whatever. You never know, but, like, the overall point is Zacchaeus knew his role, and you're right, you said something really key. You know, the, you know, a lot of these players, it the, the, the mentality is knowing your role. And when Julio coming in, argue, arguably being a fourth option behind AJ, Smitty, and Goddard, you know what I mean? That's a you know, that's a that's a that's a hard pivot for a guy of his caliber. Um, I'm curious to see how it works out myself. Um, but I'm kind I'm kind of with you. Like I didn't really understand it when the move happened. Yeah, I mean, uh it, I Look, they didn't have a lot of depth, and you know, from that perspective, if somebody does sprain an ankle or hurt a hamstring, you know, it's better to have Julio Jones than Quez Watkins or or or, or Alameda Zacchaeus. Yeah. But I did think, you know, something else interesting this week was um, if you heard Nick earlier in the week wasn't even asked. He was he was talking about Julio. And he went on this tangent about Alameda Zacchaeus and how he will always have a part in a, in a Nick Sirianni offense. And I just thought it was very strange because nobody asked him a question about Oz. And he went on this long soliloquy about him. And I started Do you to think, think that was more so for Oz rather than for you guys? Maybe. Or maybe... You know, remember who's in charge of this roster. It's not Nick Sirianni. Mm -hmm. um, and Nick Sirianni's the football guy. And Nick Sirianni's the guy who understands roles more than Howie Roseman. And I, 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 as you know, I've given Howie a lot of credit. He's, I think, the best general manager in the NFL. But I, when they made this move, I got a little dream teamish kind of tint to it. Um, Please I didn't don't bring see, that era up. <laughs> that I was didn't, a nasty I, era. Nasty. I didn't. I didn't see the fit, um, and I still don't see the fit. And you know, Nick doing that sort of made me think maybe he doesn't see the fit either. But it could be simpler. It could be what you said. It could be just he's trying to pump up Alameda Zacchaeus, who, you know, Keep just got knocked down a peg. It could be as simple as that, but it, it could be more. It could be more than that. So really quick, John, I got to sneak this one. I got to sneak this one in. You, you said you, you said how he is the one that controls his roster, right? So Julio, that was a, that was clearly a Howie decision. Uh, well, everything roster-wise is uh, – look, it's collaborative. It, Howie is smart enough now. He just doesn't, you know, act like a, a – Tyrant. <laughs> the, yeah, thank you. De facto tyrant. Um, he used to, <laughs> and he's learned a lot over the years. Um, 
But yeah, he makes the final decision. So, okay. I mean, and he said uh, one of the things he learned from the Jalen Rager debacle was his name's on everything. Very similar to Nick Sirianni as a coach. Nick always says, my name's on everything on, on the field. Um, offense, defense, special teams. Howie's name is on that roster. So, you know, he kind of acquiesced to the coaching staff. Um, the scouting staff recommended Justin Jefferson. Um, and he and he went with the with the coaching staff. And you know, he gets blamed for it. So, you know, if if he thinks something is important. He will put his foot down and make that decision. Now, I don't think Julio Jones at this stage of his career at 34 is that type of decision. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought it, I, I just thought it was a little bit interesting the way Nick went out of his way to to prop up Alamade Zacchaeus. It made me think that he didn't necessarily think he needed an upgrade at that particular position. Remember it puts pressure on the coaching staff because this is Julio Jones. Mm -hmm. So now, and he, by the way, he also said this offense still goes through AJ Brown, Devontae Smith, Dallas Goddard, which it should, but because of the name, I guarantee you there's going to be people outside the building saying if Julio gets one catch to get, Where's Julio Jones? Yeah, that'd be that'd be uh, foolish to know how this roster is already built. All right, John, I got to get your prediction before we get out of here, my friend. Me, myself, um, I'm, I'm going out on the limb here. I got the Philadelphia Eagles winning this game, 31-30. Uh, what's your prediction, my friend? 28-24. Uh, I think it's going to be a little bit lower scoring than people realize. Uh, remember, again, the one game on the road, Buffalo, Miami only scored 20 points, uh, and they gave up 48. Um, so, um, yeah, I think people are too enamored by 70 against Denver and 45 against Carolina. All right, there you guys have it. Look. Me and John are gonna uh, try to get back to you guys tomorrow. We have a lot much more. We have a lot much more to discuss. Um, you know, with you guys, man. This is again. This is gonna be a hell of a matchup, and it's gonna be super exciting to watch. Make sure you guys plus all your bets. Make sure you guys make, make sure you guys got all your your game day plans locked in. Sunday night Sunday night football is in full effect, and I'm definitely here for it. Uh, make sure you guys smash that like button. Continue to stay engaged. Also, make sure you guys are subscribed to the Jacob Sports YouTube channel. Also, if you guys want more from John McMullen, check him out on Burge 365 every morning, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern Time with his partner in crime, Jody Mack. And also check him out on JacobSports.com and check his articles out on SportsIllustrated.com. That's SI.com. John, let's get out of here, man. You guys are locked in on football 24-7. He's John McMullen. I'm your guy, Tone. The show's the second. And we're out of here.